Okay, so I'm Danielle Varda. Um, I'm the CEO and founder at Visible Network Labs and um, happy to be here with everyone today. We are launching a new webinar series. Um, if you've been uh, a, a participant and an audience member in the past, we've um, been doing regularly a, some, a webinar series called Network Leadership Lessons from the Field. And we'll continue that, but with a little less frequently. And what we're really committed to in 2022 is really thinking about social connectedness and focusing on that as a topic. We work with a lot of people who are also doing this work around the country, in fact, around the world. And it's our goal always to elevate those projects and people in different ways. And so this is one of the ways that we get to do that. So we'll talk a little bit more about the plan ahead. Um, so a couple of things. Um, today I'm going to just do a little background and um, housekeeping on the on the webinar today. Um, today it will be um, just the VNL team presenting myself and Dr. Rose Hardy, who is one of our network scientists are, um, here at Visible Network Labs. We did have uh, Casley Killen uh, with us to present, but she is sick today. Um, I have a feeling she is. Um, having a setback like many of us have been experiencing over the last few months and years in terms of having to step out of important things because we are not well. And so um, Casley is part of uh, Social Health Labs and we look forward to bringing her back um, in the future and really sorry for anyone who is looking forward to seeing her today. It was a really last minute kind of shift. So instead, um, I'll kind of be filling in on some parts of it, but I think we'll be able to really have a great conversation around key concepts around social connectedness. Um, just a couple other housekeeping things. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't just bring to um, the uh, screen the whole team at Visible Network Labs that's involved with making the work that we do possible from our data science team, our development and communications and marketing team, um, product team. It's just quite a, a group and a, a connection, a group of social connections that we have together that um, all working towards a common mission. Um, our overall webinar series is planned for um, the whole year. So there is a lot of wiggle room in this, but if you're trying to think about ways that you can participate in these conversations or even just listen in, we hope that you'll take a look at this. One of our asks for everyone today is that you tell us what you're interested in, or if you know of a great project or a person who can participate in these conversations, please email us and let us know. Our goal is to make these conversations as inclusive and open as possible. And so um, today you'll see the Visible Network Labs um, team, but our hope is that we're actually really highlighting more of the projects and people um, who, are, who are doing this work. So these are the areas in which we have um, begun to focus. So take a look at this um, and, think where you might be connected to some of these topics and let us know because we'd really love to hear from you. Um, the two that are upcoming um, right away, next um, month we're gonna be focused on social connectedness and older adults. And so some of the work that we've been doing, but especially our partners and community are working on so social connectedness with older adults. So we do hope that you will uh, find time to join this one. Uh, we almost have all of the presentations aligned uh, ready, but if you also have ideas or would like to contribute to this, let us know. And then following that in March will be our uh, webinar on social connectedness and young people. And this will be a really unique opportunity to get to hear from um, some young people that we have the pri privilege of working with um, through the NE Casey Foundation. We run a social connectedness fellowship for young people. And our fellows have finished their first year of work and have done a lot of research and um, interviews and analysis of data around adolescence and um, social connectedness. So that'll be a really unique opportunity to hear from young people on the topic. So we look forward to you joining us there as well. Um, one last opportunity is uh, Visible Network Labs runs along with and a partnership with the University of Colorado Denver and the School of Public Affairs, um, a, a yearly network summit. Um, this year we're running the network in the second annual uh, network innovation summit and this is where we're really going to spend some time just broadly at more of a systems level exploring the future of networks. So if you just love to geek out on networks, but you're really interested in kind of where we're going and how they're impacting 
big problems, complex problems like social connectedness, but also other areas, um, please, uh, you know, keep track of that and, and we hope that you will join us. All right, so before we get started on some of the presentations, we really love to do something here at Visible Network Labs, which we call Visible Us. When we do webinars, um, we, you, you, you'll get a sense really quickly that we're very conversational. We like to um, hear from you. We like to put um, different kinds of little twists, I think, on the webinar that allow us to really put a human touch on it. And um, one of the things uh, that we do do is with our speakers, this, this section called Visible Us. So uh, Rose is our presenter today in partnership um, with me. And um, before we she presents, I think one of the things that we often miss in terms of our um, opportunities when we get to hear these presentations of work is to really understand who the person is, um, who we're hearing from. So Rose, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take a minute before we even go on to just ask you to kind of introduce yourself. And what we try to do is always ask a couple of questions. And in those questions, we um, hope to just let our presenters um, tell us a little bit more about them. So Rose, I've had the opportunity to know Rose for a number of years um, when I met her as a, a student actually at the University of Colorado in the School of Public Health. But Rose, do you mind doing a little introduction? And then I'm gonna ask you these two questions and it won't be a, um, a, a, a surprise to anyone what they are because I put them up here so we can all really know um, what we're gonna learn from you. Yeah, um, I'm Rose Hardy. It's, it's nice to meet you all um, and, and see you all. Uh, I'm a network data scientist, as, as Danielle mentioned, here at Visible Network Labs. I've been here about a little over a year now. Awesome. Um, yeah. All right, Rose. Well, I'm just going to get into it. So there's two things I was thinking about today, and this is about social connectedness. Um, and one thing I been curious about and I want to hear you talk about is what has been your professional journey to get here. What brought you into a place where you can study uh, and think about social connectedness on a regular basis? Yeah, um, you know, so people that know me are probably going to be tired of hearing me talk about Montana and pediatric cardiology, but since most of you don't know me, <laughs> um, I'm just going to go for it. Uh, so I grew up here in Missoula, Montana. Um, and have been lucky enough to, to move back here relatively recently. Um, my dad was the pediatric cardiologist for Western Montana for about 18 years before he retired. Um, and as a result of um, you know, growing up here and, and seeing his work, uh, I was able to see some of the joys and some of the challenges to um, providing pediatric specialty care in uh, more rural communities. Uh, and because I saw that those connections and those relationships um, are particularly important, especially when sort of formal supports can be hundreds or thousands of miles away. Um, it's really been an important focus of, of my work um, and what uh, made me interested in pursuing a master's in public health and then a PhD in health services research. Um, and I've continued uh, some of that work uh, around pediatric cardiology specifically um, in my dissertation. Um, so. Uh, looked specifically at uh, how young adults with congenital heart disease transition from pediatric care settings into adult care settings um, and how their relationships between different providers um, can impact the success of that transition. Um, and then from there, my, my postdoc work at Nationwide Children's Hospital continued to think about how the uh, pediatric care setting um, and the places that we live and other social determinants of health can impact that care. Um, and now here at BNL, um, thinking about how all those, all those factors sort of impact um, our health and well being. Excellent. Well, I know, I mean, this is a selfish remark, but you can see why we're so. Um, pleased uh, that Rose chose Visible Network Labs to come and, and work and uh, share her passion for, for social connectedness, but also her expertise and, and skills around it. So you're going to get to hear a lot more about the, the work that um, Rose continues to do in that area um, in, in just a little bit. But before we do that, we also kind of um, like to know a little bit more, even uh, more than your just your professional profile. Um, so this question is, you know, a lot of us have uh, personal reasons that we come to mission-driven career paths. And so if you'd be willing, I'm wondering, have you had any experiences personally that have helped really um, frame the way that you think about social connectedness? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think like a lot of people that have pursued education for a long time, it means moving around a lot. Um, and so building community, communities wherever you go. Um, but for me personally, um, I have epilepsy. Uh, and so building that social support network has been felt particularly uh, pressing uh, in, in some cases. And so uh, certainly it means some of the practical aspects of finding medical care providers in, in new communities. Um, so you have access to the medications and the healthcare support that you need. But uh, there are also some squishier things uh, as well uh, in terms of relationship building. Um, who do you tell about certain aspects of your life? Um, so mm -hmm. say, who needs to know uh, that I could have a seizure um, and what to do in, in that situation? So certainly people like uh, that I'm living with or uh, sharing office space with need to know that, but uh, what do the other people need to know and how much do you wanna share? Um, and so the, those are the sort of calculations you have to make uh, each time that you meet new people um, and build that community and all of that um, impacts uh, that community and that emotional and social, social support that, that you have. Um, and then, you know, when I came here to VNL, uh, we get the chance to familiarize ourselves with the platform. Uh, and it was the first time I really got to visualize what that social support network looked like. Um, and the first time that I also realized I never actually had a doctor ask me um, whether or not I had people that could help me um, or support me in times when say you change your medication um, and are there to check on you and make sure that everything is going all right. Um, so it's sort of those experiences that, that I bring to, to this, um, this work and how we build um, community and connection and its impact Thank on you. our health. Yeah, thank you, Rose. Um, you know, it's a, a, I think we all have our own stories of, of social connectedness and how they've inspired or been challenging um, in, in our life path. So I think that's, uh, thank you for sharing. I think that we will um, hear more about this over the course of this year from people. We'll, we'll continue to do our visible us section because we just think it's really important. We, we talk about this, like uh, learning about the people behind the projects. Um, so that's our opportunity here. I did want to take an opportunity. I am just already floored by all of the people, um, the introductions in the chat. So please be sure to put your introduction in the chat. It's um, wild actually to see the amount of people who are working on this already um, who have introduced themselves. But I'd also like to take a minute to do a little bit of a connection with the group here. So this is, I'll go ahead and, um, put the, I'm gonna stop uh, the presentation for a second. This is just, you know, a Mentimeter um, thing, but I just thought we could take a second to, um, let's see, I'm trying to find the chat to put that in there. Whoops, sorry. Um, you can either just take, oh, there it is. You can take a picture um, of it, or you can go to this link that I just put in the chat. And I just have a couple of questions for us so we could do kind of a get to know you here as a big group. So if anyone is not able to get there, if you could put in the chat that it's you're having a problem, um, let me know. I'm gonna leave this up for just another second and then I'll go ahead and go over there. Um, yeah, and let me know if it's, if it's not working. This is one of those things, I never know if it's gonna work or not. But um, so what we're doing here is just trying to get to know us a little bit. So the first question is just, who are you? And so I put in here, just, you know, put anything, a job, you know, what kind of uh, family member you are, adjective, hobby, like, for example, I'm a teacher, an uncle, I, um, carefree, a painter. Awesome. Um, and if anyone, if you can't see my screen, please let me know. You should be seeing the actual word cloud that we're getting. Um, that's being um, built right now. Great, I had no idea how this would work with a crowd that I really knew not a lot about. And so um, this is just really amazing. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of let it go for a minute and, and, and be quiet while we watch it build. Awesome.
Well, and so most of you will, will know, but if you don't, this is this just tool called Mentimeter and it's free for a couple of these questions. But um, I just really love this because I was trying to think of a way that we could kind of um, use something to get to, to know each other without really having the time to do so. But I figured when we are um, building a, up a community around social connectedness, um, it's important to take a couple of minutes uh, to do just that. Okay, great. So, I mean, this is awesome. The, the bigger words are the ones that um, pop up more often, but, you know, and we, we're seeing researcher, mom, father, friend, wife, connector, advocate, partner, music lover, and then, of course, all these ones on the outside. So, we have a lot of diversity here, human being, aspiring business owner, a nerd. So, this is awesome. So, um, I'll just give us a second here. So we have, um, there's two questions um, on here. The next one is a little bit more about social connectedness. So I think I can just um, go to it. If you don't see the next question, could you all let me know? Um, the next one is what are three to five words that come to mind when you're thinking about social connectedness? Is anyone able to see that one? I don't see anything we're, popping up. We're, we're seeing it, Danielle. Perfect. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Perfect. Okay, so this one is a little bit more about our topic. What are our three to five words that come to mind when we're thinking about social connectedness? You know, at Visible Network Labs, we are researchers, so I think of everything as kind of a data point. So this helps us think about um, and understand the way people, what lens they're seeing the work through. Um, so this is great, thank you. All right, again, I'm just gonna let us fill it up for a moment. Wonderful. Great, and I think one of the things um, we are trying to do at Visible Network Labs through this webinar series is really set up um, a way to have conversation and, and dialogue about this really important topic. And so um, there are so many different ways that you all are putting um, perceptions of, of social connectedness. And I think that that helps us understand how, how people are thinking through it, but also I think this is highlighting just the importance of this topic in terms of getting some common understanding and concepts around social connectedness that we can work on together as a larger community um, in addressing. And so um, I see here a lot of positive words too, collaboration, friends, family, community, relationships, um, you know, and, and others that we know are some of the harder parts about social connectedness like loneliness or conflict, um, things like that. So just this is just wonderful. Uh, feel free to, to keep doing that. This is part of what we can send out afterwards as um, you know some results of, of what we've been up to. Um, yeah, and thanks. If anyone has any comments on, on this or smarter things to say about it than, than I am, please you know, go ahead and put it in the chat. You can even unmute yourself. We're, we're just really open here to conversation, but um, great. Thank you all for that. I'm gonna go ahead and go back over to our um, presentation. All right, well, thanks for, for spending that time. It, it's good to get a good look at um, our visible us of, of who's here. Um, I'm gonna just kind of set the stage for social connectedness and some concepts um, in our own learnings. Um, I've been studying this um, area of, of work for about 20 years. I started studying this stuff when I was in um, grad school, really looking at the systems level, at how organizations work together to really build strong social connectedness around solving big complex problems. And um, I quickly became a network scientist, meaning I use concepts of network science and a methodology in particular called social network analysis to measure these things and went on to work at the Rand Corporation as a policy scientist for a few years where we got some funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to start building a platform. Um, I didn't know then, but I know now I'm a technologist and my go-to solution has always been some kind of data technology solution. And so from there, I've built out our partner platform and, and now this work um, that I took through to the University of Colorado Denver 
started this Centra Network Science and then Visible Network Labs. Um, but a, a common thing that has occurred over the last few years as people, especially have experienced um, collectively as a, as a planet, uh, the COVID and the, and the pandemic and all of the um, consequences of that is, is really how social connectedness has become one of our social determinants of health, but not just health, a social determinant of education and well-being um, and other all kinds of other outcomes for, for folks. And that's one reason uh, we're really curious about how to measure social connectedness and talk about it and think about it um, here at Visible Network Labs. You know, I did some Googling of what is social connectedness and how people um, describe it. And I'm, I'm not gonna read these out to you, but you know, there is a lot of words here that we saw in our word cloud about these concepts of social connectedness and what we believe it to be. Um, for example, the experience of belonging to a social relationship or network, um, you know, experiencing feelings of, of close and connected, being close and connected to others. A lot of positive things um, that we can see there. And the, the last one I liked because it really um, talked about social connectedness, bringing us comfort, providing love, allowing uh, others to confide in each other, but also it being an important um, for achieving other goals, like getting jobs and learning new skills. Um, I think that's something we wanna really explore over the next year, which is how social connectedness not only affects um, our feelings of belonging and love and um, concepts like that, but also how social connectedness affects outcomes like related to achieving goals or um, you know, es escaping poverty or uh, getting out of different other kinds of um, situations. And so this is something that we're <clears throat> pretty focused on um, in different ways. One thing that we do know, and I, I'm not even gonna go much into this here because I do believe that most people here on this call have this frame of reference already, is that there is ample evidence that social connectedness influence outcomes, whether they be health outcomes or other kinds of relationships, there is just an enormous amount of research on this. Um, it affects um, our uh, life expectancy, our mental health, our uh, physical health, um, related to all kinds of different things. And um, there's been studies that show that it's um, sometimes one of the most um, important factors in, in some of these outcomes. Um, so what I'm hoping we can do is kind of uh, frame this from a starting place of, of where social connectedness is, um, where we know it's influencing outcomes, but really start to ask harder questions even, which is like, how do we uh, translate that into action and policy and um, programs and things like that. So what we're hoping to do over the next year is bring a series of webinars that allow us to really say, okay, now what? You know, what are we going to do? What is the next step um, from a lot of different perspectives? And so um, that's kind of the, the goal here. Um, some of you might know Susan Pinkler, who studies social connections. Um, and this quote I like, she said, uh, the research is clear. I can't. One second. There we go. The research is clear. Strong social connections predict the quantity and quality of our days. So in an era marked by loneliness and superficial connection, how can we build the connections uh, we need to thrive? And this was uh, printed in an article by Michael Miller in the sixsecondsorg um, uh, site. And I, I thought this was a really um, convincing question in terms of you know, what, what I'm hoping we can do here. So if we know that the problem exists, you know, how are we going to, to move forward on that? Um, the way that we, in, in terms of thinking about social connectedness, we, we like to frame it in a couple of ways at VNL that might be a little unique. Um, what we know about people is that they do use a lot of informal and formal supports um, to, to feel well and to have access to healthcare and things like that. That's not that surprising, but what we have really learned is that, sorry, that what we know about people is that some people have a lot of connections to others. And those connections are strong and healthy and feel really great to that person. But there's also a lot of people who, who have no one or just one person. And that variation in the way that social connectedness appears is often invisible. And while we're all embedded in social connectedness and we all have connections, they're largely invisible, not only to ourselves, but the people who care for us. And so it's a concept that 
while we can agree it's probably one of the most influential in terms of outcomes, it's also one of the most invisible and hard to understand factors. And so it makes it really challenging for us to take that next step of solutions, policy, program, you know, individual and systemic um, solutions. Um, one of my favorite things always, and I encourage everyone to do, is when I'm looking up a topic or starting research, I go to Google Images, and I just try to see what pops up, especially as I add different factors in. And um, something that we have really realized is, you know, social connectedness just looks really different. So for some, it's I, you know, it's 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 a strong connection to others. Um, we often think of social connect, adverse social connectedness as isolation and loneliness, but what we have also found is that there's also folks that are connected to a lot of others that may be unhealthy for them. So connections that necessarily um, may be not just, the problem may not be that you don't have connections, but that your connections are unhealthy. You might be connected to abusers or users or things like this that make it um, difficult. So we're really trying to explore the differences in social connectedness um, that really don't are not just based on account of who is in your life, but also the quality of those connections. Um, I really, I, I loved this quote um, as I was prepping for this today. Um, from Brene Brown, you know, why human connection will bring us closer together was a just a Forbes interview um, that I looked at uh, that I found and uh, she talks about, she, she was describing social connections and she said, you know, it's that connection, the spirit that flows between us and every other human in the world. She says, it's not something that can be broken. However, our belief in the connection is constantly tested and repeatedly severed. And I thought this was um, the right thing to bring forward today because I think one of the things that we also hope to bring as conversation to the table is the complexity of social connectedness. So where it's not, uh, it, it's something that we often speak about social connectedness in a positive way. Um, it's something that we see growing right now in terms of um, a chronic uh, in, increases in isolation um, and depression and um, social, um, disconnectedness. And so it's such a complicated topic. It's often really difficult for us to um, really conceptualize it. Um, sometimes I, I think of it um, in this way myself. And what brought me to this work was really some of my own personal stories uh, that I sometimes like to tell. But um, this was um, a, an experience that I had not long ago. And it's really been something that has motivated me throughout my life to continue on, on this work. But um, I, uh, this is uh, my mom who had uh, breast cancer and actually one of my three daughters, this is my middle one, her name is Harlow. And many years ago when my mom had breast cancer, I used to take her to her uh, appointments. And one time I remember her um, oncologist asking her about how she was doing. And it was the first time that I really heard her talk about um, having trouble, like getting up the stairs and fixing uh, meals for herself and things like that. And um, not surprisingly, her, her oncologist um, asked her how she was doing. Do you have anyone to help you when you need it? Not that unusual of a question, but her answer, she said, yes, I, I, I do. I have three adult daughters in town. Um, and he was just really happy to hear that. What he didn't know, of course, was that uh, two of us are estranged. There was another sister whose husband had just had a stroke and she was, you know, having in the ICU, I think at the time, um, working um, on that. And so really there wasn't a lot of social connectedness and coordination um, for my mom at that time, but her doctor had no idea. Like all he really knew was this was a great answer, but really what my mom was experiencing was adverse social connectedness. And so a lot of the times, you know, those of us who are embedded in this work, we even experience these um, adverse social connectedness when we can't even see it, even with someone like me, um, I always uh, uh, talk about how I um, have been a network scientist for all this time and even I couldn't see these things. And so um, it's really important topic that we need to focus on and spend time with. Um, I, I usually, I, I, this, this uh, was something that I found after um, my mom passed away 
when thinking more about um, the consequences of not having a coordinated network of care. Um, and you can read it for just a moment, but we, this is exactly what I was talking about when I say there is so much um, research that says this is an issue, this is something we should pay attention to. This is just one example um, of, of many, and I can't wait to actually go through uh, the whole year of, of work on these different topics and explore these different things. Okay, so getting to the end, because I want to transfer it over to Rose, um, just a couple of last things if I can go over. Um, I just am going to end with a little bit of context about visible network labs um, and why uh, we kind of believe that we want to, you know, and, and hope that we can be a thought leader in this area and a, and a conversation platform. Um, so I'll just let you know a little bit about um, VNL. Um, our, you, you've heard this now a few times, but our goal is to make invisible networks visible. Um, we are a social enterprise dedicated to strengthening social connectedness, and we really do envision a world where everyone has the social support that they need, and our mission is to make that happen. Um, we do that by providing trainings and uh, workshops. We do focus on technology-based solutions, and particularly mapping and, and measurement tools. But our hope is that we're providing opportunities for collaborative innovation by translating data to practice. Um, we work with folks all over the country and now actually all over the world. So we have projects um, throughout um, 10 different countries at the moment um, and then all over the country. But we also have users who use our platform uh, who we don't interact with at all. Um, oops, sorry, I didn't realize this was on an animation. These are some of our partners um, that we work with. And we're just really proud of, of not only our relationships with them, but that these folks have come to us to say, you know, we're really trying to solve issues of social connectedness, actually at the systems level or the individual level. Um, there's a lot more that uh, we work with, but it's, it's something that a lot of people are paying attention to. Um, we do use network science as a unique lens on social connectedness. Um, this is a, a picture we drew one day to kind of say, what if we could solve all the problems? What would it look like? This is kind of our, our way of, of showing, you know, the people who, um, the way that we look at social connectedness, for example, at the individual level, um, community level, uh, the carrying capacity of whole states and, and larger regions to, to address these issues, and then even the policy and, you know, national uh, solutions that are coming um, out to help us solve these problems. It's really not any one of these. It's the combination of all of these levels um, and work together of, of thousands and thousands of partners across the world that I think um, is the only way that we'll really be able to, to solve this issue. Uh, we do this at Visible Network Labs through our partner platform. We have a platform called the CPRM, the Community Relationship um, management, wait, it's community partner relationship management system that allows us to track networks at um, the systems level. So for example, how organizations are working together to solve these big problems. But we also run Partner Me, which is a way to screen a person on their personal support networks, make that visible for a provider, and then connect them to care based um, on the, the, the things that we learn about. So in the case of my mom, for example, had that oncologist had a tool like this, he might have given it to her and really was, you know, been able to see how complicated um, and at risk that she was um, had she been able to provide this kind of information to him. Um, last thing our, I, I thought I would mention is our VNL values, beliefs, and philosophies about social connectedness. Our work is really based on a strengths based approach. Um, and uh, at VNL, we really honor a person's personal strengths and the assets they bring to their own care. Um, and our work is, is working to leverage their strengths first and then fill the gaps. So we've done a lot of research over decades now, um, and we learn so much all the time. We're constantly learning um, about this topic, but things that we have found is that people's social support systems are mostly informal. They want to help themselves. They prefer to build personal resiliency over using system supports um, but that people have personal assets that they bring to their own care and that we often, we, we fail to, we rarely ask them about them and we often fail to leverage them when trying to help. So what we're trying to do here at VNL is really use these learnings that we have about social connectedness to, to build solutions. Um, 
we do this work in several different areas and we hope to bring that throughout the year to, to this conversation. Um, I've mentioned our work with Adolescent Social Support and the NE Casey Foundation, but we also do work, for example, on social isolation with Resetas, which is a, ten, uh, or a seven country project um, working on social isolation and um, nature-based prescribing as a solution. Um, we work with, oops, my, sorry, my logos are a little messed up, but suicide prevention for veterans, mental health, um, behavioral health with some of our mental health centers in Colorado, um, and some work on education and school systems with uh, partners like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so I'm just gonna end with reminding you that we're gonna go through all of these topics, we hope in great detail um, in the future. Um, and I cannot say enough, please connect with us and let us know what you wanna hear. If you wanna talk about these things, um, we're really just trying to build a big community right now of, of folks who can, who can do this together with us. Um, so I am gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna pass it over to Rose. Um, and luckily we're gonna get to hear about some actual projects and actual work um, in this area. And Rose, as you're transitioning to share your screen, um, I do just wanna open it up for a moment to see if anyone had any um, questions or thoughts, um, feel free to unmute yourself, don't be shy. We can spend a minute doing that before we go over. You know, I think you have to make me co-host or, or something. <laughs> This is gonna give us time to do that, especially if someone has a question. <laughs> Let me get there. Okay. Um, there we go. Great. And again, we, you know, we're, we're real sorry, Casley could not be here today. And uh, we will plan to bring her back. She's doing some great work at Social Health Labs. Um, especially around community building and support for this work. So we can look forward to hearing more from her, hopefully as soon as she's feeling better. Okay, Rose. Yeah, um, so, you know, as Danielle has talked about, we're certainly talking about social relationships and connectedness. Uh, and there is a lot of literature, right, to indicate that uh, social isolation, uh, lack of uh, these types of relationships can be associated with increased mortality, morbidity, um, greater feelings of loneliness, uh, prevalence of other mental health conditions. Uh, and it's one of the reasons we think it's an important topic for uh, understanding and to, and to research. Um, and then thinking about how social support itself functions. Um, for example, are there direct effects? Um, does having social support in and of itself um, benefit an individual? Um, can it moderate stressful events? Um, so does having social support during a, a difficult time mean, um, mean more than it does during uh, a non-stressful time? Um, it's been a little bit more difficult to evaluate uh, because these have been relatively subjective measures and have been measured in a, a lot of different ways. Um, that said, we'll go through a little bit of how we're thinking about these connections and how we're measuring them um, and some of the things that, that we've been learning so far. Um, so when we think about social connectedness uh, and the dimensions that we've been using to, to measure it, uh, we look at uh, sort of how well the people in a network can work together when they need help, um, uh, sort of a network measure of the relationship quality of a person's uh, support network uh, members. Um, and we have this hypothesis that it's better to have more members that you trust a lot but aren't necessarily dependent on. Um, and we use that to assess our quality of the relationships. Uh, and then finally, um, this measure of a person's overall perception of social support. Uh, and while it's still early in the process, we're starting to see some correlation between uh, self-rated overall health and social connectedness. So people with higher rated um, overall health also have higher levels of social connectedness. Um, and we're also finding some of those correlations between self-rated uh, mental health and social connectedness. Um, again, those with higher rated mental health also have higher uh, levels of, of social support. Um, and to, to measure that, we, we do it a couple of different ways with, with Partner Me. Uh, we ask people about um, rating their own health um, or loneliness, um, and then, <laughs> Um, 
we ask about um, how these members know each other and can work together when they need help. So that's what's happening. There we go. <laughs> um, and then in addition, we ask about some of their most pressing needs um, and they can choose the ones um, that apply. So because we think that that understanding, uh, that understanding a person's support network helps with the needs that they have, we also ask about how uh, the people in their support network help them with their concerns. Um, by doing this, we're able to see how a person's network is already helping them um, and where they may benefit from um, more or more targeted help. So for example, I can say, Danielle, it looks like you're, um, well, it's getting your childcare and food um, concerns addressed pretty well, um, but it looks like you could help use some help with work um, needs. Um, and, and how about we start there? Uh, in addition, we can get a sense of the quality of these uh, support relationships. We can ask about how much they trust that person to be able to help them in times of need uh, and how much they depend on these people in times of need. Um, Again, we have this working hypothesis that it's better to have a higher trust and lower dependency on your support members um, than, uh, let's see, <laughs> low trust and, and high dependency. Um, and with these maps, you can start to see how people are using their support networks to address the concerns that they have in their lives. Um, and it can be helpful to start conversations about how best to address these concerns. We've been implementing that in a variety of settings. Um, it's been used as an online uh, survey tool among um, veterans and uh, families with children and young adults. It's also been used in, in primary care, uh, mental health and, and pediatric clinics. Uh, and we're just about to start using it in some veteran service organizations. Um, all this has been helping us to understand networks across different groups and different communities. So far, we've had about 475 respondents, um, and they've been reporting on about 1,248 different support members um, and described about 386 uh, social support networks. So I wanted to go through just a couple of points um, from our work. Um, and so one of the things that we've been learning from our work with veterans has been that a social support network uh, may not be addressing all of the needs that a person has. So for example, here, 90% uh, of veterans that indicated that they had a transportation need didn't have someone in their network that could help them address that need. Um, and 70% had a healthcare or an emergency need uh, that their support members couldn't help them with. So one of the questions that sort of comes out of that is, are there better ways that we can work to incorporate more quote unquote formal supports uh, into um, people's support networks to address some of these concerns. Um, this map can be a little bit difficult to understand at first glance, uh, but here we see families represented as blue or red circles uh, and their social concern as a, a green circle that they have. So if there's a line, it means that the family says that they have a need um, that they need currently addressed. Um, and the red and the blue indicates whether or not the family perceives themselves to have low or high levels of um, social support. So if you look at uh, this highlighted blue circle, that represents a family that uh, thought they had high levels of social support um, and has needs around um, housing and utilities, around social support, um, and around clothing. Um, and the darker line there means that um, clothing was their most pressing need. Uh, when we look at young families, we see that there are varying levels of perceived social support um, and that families can have multiple needs uh, and still perceive themselves to have high levels of social support. So understanding what those networks look like um, and some of the qualities of those people um, can maybe help us figure out how to leverage some of that support into their own care. Um, and then as we look at young adults, uh, we see that um, their social support networks are made up primarily of 
family and friends. Um, and that's not that dissimilar from uh, our finding in, in other uh, groups. But given the hesitancy of some of these young adults to reach out to more formal um, or official sources of support, uh, we wonder if there are ways to leverage uh, friend and peer mentors with some of these young adults to address some of their concerns, particularly concerns uh, where they feel um, formal supports or older adults are less able to understand their concerns. Um, and then given the need for some guidance and some future planning, uh, are there better ways to incorporate teachers and mentors and um, more formal organizations to help them achieve uh, their own goals and, and to thrive? So uh, as we uh, continue on, there are a lot of questions left to ask, right, and to answer, and we look forward to thinking about them more, um, and honestly, to, to do them with you guys as well, and to, it's part of what makes this community so nice, is to getting to talk about it and figure out uh, how, we, how we better address these things. Um, that said, some of the things that we're thinking about uh, include, does that stress buffering hypothesis look different in different communities or populations? Um, are there some ways that a person's social support network evolves uh, during stressful times or over the course of one's treatment? Uh, does recognizing a person's social support network and coming from that strengths-based approach that Danielle mentioned uh, lead to better health outcomes or better referral outcomes? Um, and are there some patterns of social needs that we can identify and determine better ways to package our support to, to people? Um, are there certain types of people um, or organizations that are better equipped to help with, with certain um, different needs. But clearly there are a, a lot of questions to ask. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you. See if I can stop sharing. Well, great. Um, thanks, Rose, um, so much for going through that. Um, you know, we, uh, we don't want the whole webinar to be about visible network labs. Um, and we, we, we tried today to have um, um, some variations, which is really important to us that, that we're getting to view this view through a few different lenses. So I kind of want to open it up for a minute and really ask if anyone has anything to add, any insights either from this presentation or that you have on your own that can contribute to the conversation. I just um, really wanna uh, encourage um, helping you all uh, believe that we are um, wanting to hear from, from others. So whether you have a question in the chat or just want to you know, raise your hand and let us know what you're working on and you know, how either this relates or some other uh, finding or learning around social connectedness um, as a concept, we'd love to hear it. Um, I'll go ahead to the, to, to the question. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna actually introduce uh, David Alward here. Or David, maybe I'd ask you to introduce yourself um, if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> uh, David, I, I know from Colorado and he is, um, uh, I, I, David, I'm going to have you introduce yourself. I'm going to introduce you as a as from, from as a friend. Uh, there is almost um, no one as committed uh, to the work of coordination of of care and and for people, I think, than than David and especially his colleagues and the work that he's doing in terms of getting um, finding solutions. But David, do you mind introducing yourself, and then you can ask your question out loud. <laughs> Sure. Well, you're very kind. Um, and as I said to you privately in the chat, you're a very brave person to share your personal experience. I'm not sure I could show a picture of my mom with cancer and be able to keep talking. Um, uh, my name is David Aylward. I'm an assistant clinical professor at the Department of Family Medicine and Farley Center at the Department, University of Colorado. And we're working on something called uh, collaborative community response which is trying to bring communities together with led by community leaders to help people thrive, the kind of people that Danielle and Rose are talking about. And what intrigues me here is almost all of those conversations are about organizations stepping up and helping, a food bank, a primary care clinic, a dentist, a housing agency. There's, there's an assumption that it's a human being uh, who needs help dealing directly with organizations and agencies. But what Danielle's underlining here is what we actually know to be true, 
but isn't in those models, which is people look first to friends and family for help, um, if, if only to for how to navigate a system. Um, and, and so I find fascinating that one, the access to help is through friends and family, which I knew, but you're saying scientifically. Two, it's not part of any of those models. Um, three, you're using strengths-based, which nobody does. That's all kind of uh, screening for social disease. You know, you, you, you need food, you need housing. And it's just, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated that, that we, maybe not surprised, but still fascinated that, that you're over here and there's a whole conversation going over here. Now, I, I know you're, we're trying to get you into that conversation, but so, so that's just a commentary. And then the, the question is, um, because connectedness is a determinant by itself, which is your second point, which is fascinating. How do you measure it? What's, what's the number on this? Is it the number of quality connections? Uh, I, I, I take the point about abusive doesn't count in the positive column, but is it the number of quality connections or the number of connections or the number of my friends on Facebook, which I resigned from, but what, what is it? Um, by the you, way, thanks. this is great. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you so much. And I mean, I, I want to, this is what we believe in. I, I always say our, our team get rolls out of bed in the morning to tackle social connectedness, you know, social isolation. And it's, this is our lens, you know, and, and I, I appreciate, I, I'm going to um, talk about that for a second, but we really believe it takes a lot of lenses. So it's going to take a lot of work for us to get from us over here and here, you know, all connected to solve this big problem. But um, in terms of um, measuring it, this, the, the, the way that I got here was I was doing this work on systems of care for babies and young children with special health care needs with my colleague Ayelet Talmi at Children's Hospital in Colorado. And we were doing exactly what you said. We were measuring systems and we were trying to build perfect systems for people. And we would bring that information to the system and ask them how well it helped them serve people better. Then we brought it to families and the families were the ones that said to us, that's not how I see the world. I don't care about that system. I go to my friends and family providers and I only want an easy way to access that system when I need help, but I prefer, we've learned this from asking people to draw pictures of their networks, talk about them. People do not wanna be part of systems unless they have to, but we are pro system for sure. So our goal is to, you know, our charge I think is how do we build adaptable systems around people um, rather than building the perfect system for people, but you're right, we have to measure it. So what we do is we actually do try to look at the quality and quantity of those relationships by asking people things like, who helps you with the things you need, but then to what degree do you trust them to help you when you need it? And to what degree do you depend on them? We'd love to ask them a lot of other questions, but what we have found is adverse social connectedness is often people who are isolated or alone, but they're also people who are connected to a lot of others that they highly depend on but cannot trust to help them when they need it. And that's one way we're trying to build a risk level of, um, or an, a, 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 just a, an indicator of social connectedness, but we look for adverse social connectedness along some of those dimensions. That's, that's one way we've, be, um, found to measure it. And as you mentioned earlier, it is difficult sometimes to ask people those kinds of questions. Um, but really our therapists, our doctors, some of them are already asking us those questions. They just don't have a good way to track it. So, you know, I'll, I'll look at this next question. But I, I, I said this to, to David sometimes um, and others, but like my vision is that every single person have a social connectedness screener inside their medical record, you know, inside their school file. So that when we're having conversations with people, we are incorporating their strengths and also their gaps in their social connectedness in the conversations we have about their blood draws. You know, so that's that that's my big vision, um, and and I do hope that we can um, you know keep measuring it. But it's it's a difficult thing. I I, I always say we we love to measure hard to measure things. Um, one time I said that and someone said to me, you mean like love? <laughs> I said, yes, <laughs> we try to measure hard things like that. Um, before we, we end here, let me um, see. I see Katie Edwards, you have a, a question. Um, 
I'm just going to read it because I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I've been thinking about this in the lens of faith communities and how we build these kinds of informal supports among church communities. I've also been interested in how mental health diagnoses lay layer over social connectedness, hoping to tune in in the future. Um, thank you so much, Katie, for putting this here. Um, this is a what exactly what we want to know. What do people want to talk about? And now we know who can help us talk about it. Um, so Katie, I hope for the future you'll, you'll join us in one of these webinars um, to have that conversation. That'll be great. Um, Okay, we'll do this one last one. Um, I, I feel funny reading these. I wish you all were just um, reading them yourselves. Let's see. Um, is this Dragana? I hope that I said your, your name correctly. Um, curious about the measures and definition of social connectedness and how, to, how you see a sense of belongingness as another potential measure of connectedness. Um, really like the approach from strength. The UK model of social prescribing is based on that and it's great to see it being applied in other places too. Um, thank you so much for that comment. Again, this is a, another topic <laughs> for us. Um, belonging is its, almost its own topic. Um, I'm so glad you brought up this UK model of social prescribing. This is what we're working on with Resetas. Um, they call it nature-based prescribing, but social prescribing. And for those who are curious about that, there are folks, and, and we have a partner here in town at the Westminster Medical Clinic doing this work where they are prescribing more um, nature-based solutions for things like uh, isolation and doing it through kind of a, a prescription um, process. Okay, so we're at the top of our hour, um, and I am really grateful for everybody's time and connection today. Um, I hope that we have spurred something in everyone that uh, sparked something in everyone that we can continue to do together. And so please continue to reach out. We'd love to have all of you speaking. Um, we wanna have a community um, that we're just building and strengthening around this conversation. So thank you all so much for joining today and really look forward to, to more time together. <laughs>